Well, the Q3 numbers in, in uh, uh, 2016 look uh, good in general. Um, we see that, the, that the, the China has maintained 6.7 percent growth, and that's despite the fact that we had somewhat of a, of a slowdown in July, but, but then a pickup in, in uh, August and September. When you look at the PPI, actually, because um, we're used to looking at year-over-year -year numbers, all right, when the number in July will be July over July. And that's, it's true that that number has been negative until very recently. But if you look at the monthly number, the actual increase in producer prices during the month, the PPI has actually been positive all year. Really, it, it, it turned positive early in the year, uh, which, is, which we think is a good sign, because a negative PPI is, is, can be a, 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 a negative sign for the economy, as you say, problems with excess capacity and, 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 and reforms. Uh, but two factors, we, we need to look at two factors when you look at the, the, the change in the PPI. One is commodity prices. So one thing that, one reason why the PPI was very low and even negative uh, in recent years was that commodity prices were falling. But also one reason why the PPI has turned positive is because some of these commodity prices, oil, steel, coal, that they've been on, a, on an upward path um, this year. And those are world, determined by world markets, not just, although China does have an effect on world markets. So that's one reason why the PPI has become uh, more positive. Uh, but we also think it's true that uh, that the progress that China's made in reforms in addressing the excess capacity issues, uh, that this has also uh, likely had an important effect. Well, I think at this point in time, I think some, somewhere around 6.7 percent growth seems quite likely for 2016, given that we've had three quarters of, of this growth, and it looks like the economy is continuing to, to progress uh, Along a, along a path consistent with, with, a, with a, an annual growth rate of around 6.7. So that's what we expect for 2016. In 2017, we expect a bit, a bit lower growth, um, maybe, maybe close to 6.5%. Uh, but it, but it, it's very uncertain. It's possible that China could get a boost from, from, from higher exports. That there, there are some expectations that there may be a pickup in the world economy, but that's very uncertain. Uh, it's also uh, we see a, a rise in protectionist sentiments in many countries, which also could affect China's exports. So that's very, it remains a very uncertain part of growth. It could be China will get more growth from exports next year, but it's not certain. Uh, we look at other components of, of growth in 2016. One uh, important component has become real estate, which grew at 8.9% at, at the first three quarters uh, of, of the year. Uh, we know from international experience that this kind of growth, very rapid growth in real estate, combined with very rapid price growth, that this is usually not sustainable. It can be very volatile. Uh, the government is aware of that. And that's why measures have been taken to, to try to cool down the housing market, which we, we agree with. We think those measures are, are, are appropriate. Uh, but it but it's also means that probably next 2017 we'll not see the same kind of growth coming from real estate. So that will be one area where we will probably see slower growth. Um, the other question has to do with infrastructure and public investment, which has been, again, an important component of growth in 2016. We sure, I'm sure it will be in 2017, but there's the question of, of the credit growth and the deleveraging. Um, so those are the reasons why we think GDP growth may be a little bit lower, but still uh, uncertain. Uh, but we think that, that, that still, that 6.5% you know, that, that is very, very high, given, given the, what the world economy uh, is, is going through now. So we think if China can achieve that next year and also make progress in reforms and make progress in bringing credit growth under control, that would be a very, very successful year for China. Uh, as far as resources going to, 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 we think there's a lot of room in China, in fact, for, for reallocation of resources to more productive areas that would, that would have a higher impact on growth. Um, you know, one area was we already discussed is these excess capacity industries, the degree to which they can, that China can make progress on, on, on redirecting credit away from those industries toward more productive uses. That will certainly have a positive effect on growth. Uh, also, there are questions about public infrastructure spending and that, and that we see over time that the, that the return to growth on public infrastructure spending in China uh, in, in general has declined. Because the, the, the infrastructure projects, I mean, there's just basically a marginal 
uh, uh, decreasing return to infrastructure investment. You've already built the most important roads. Most, you know, most, most Chinese cities now have fairly good infrastructure, so now they're building things that are, that are bringing less return to growth uh, as part of a, a short-term growth stimulus. But we think those resources could, could, could you know, there, there are, are firms, very productive firms, very innovative firms in China, firms that are, that, are, that are competing very well on world markets everywhere, high tech. If, if we think if they were getting some of those resources, uh, that probably China would be better off. You know, in general, PPP, the, the world experience with PPPs is, is a bit mixed. And, they, and, and, and I think no country has really successfully done what China seems to be trying to do, and that is to increase the number of PPPs very quickly and to look at PPP as a, a way of, of raising the volume of public finance very quickly. Uh, we think that, that's, that could be a bit dangerous. And I think with, you know, what's in, in, it's encouraging, uh, it's encouraged also, uh, um, in some cases we think uh, local governments to come up with schemes that are quote unquote PPP but don't, are not really rational from the point of view of, of, of where it makes sense for the public sector and the private sector to cooperate. Uh, so PPP, we think, should not be just looked at as a, as a means of increasing finance. It should be looked at as a means of, of effectively involving the cooperation of the private sector and the public sector in certain areas. Um, so we think, we think it's very good that China is moving forward with PPP. We think there's a lot of potential for PPP in China, but we also think that, that, that there should be some, China should use some caution. Uh, we also, it's also the case that some countries that, that were a bit too um, reckless in moving forward with PPP, they ended up with a lot of, uh, of, of debts, contingent liabilities, they ended up with, 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 with difficulties with public debt because in the end, uh, the public sector, it's contingent liabilities for the public sector. Right? Uh, big question. Uh, but we think it's, a, it's also it's a very important question for China, and that you have a, you have a process now where credit growth is increasing more than twice as fast as GDP growth, uh, and and the economy is becoming quite leveraged, uh, and and I think what's more more of a concern, concern for us even than the level which which we think the level although it's high for a country of a, a, a develop a, a, an emerging market country like China the, the the level of credit in the economy is high. But the rate at which it's increasing is even more of a concern, that it could become very, very high, very fast, unless, unless uh, uh, measures are taken to moderate the credit growth. So we think that, that uh, you know, China's going to have to deal with this problem sooner or later. The problem is that the longer China waits, if China can continue to postpone it. China still has some room. It still has a lot of reserves. But, but the longer it waits, the more costly and the more potentially disruptive it could be. So even, even if you, could, you can generate a bit more short-term growth with, by, by ratcheting up credit, that's going to arguably, in the, in the medium term, decrease your prospects for growth and, it will, and, and increase the probability that there'll be a disruptive process that will, that will slow down growth for a number of years. So we hope that's what China can avoid, we think, now, if China can take measures to slow down the credit growth, bring it under control. Um, so, and, and yes, in, in the short term, this can have a, a partly negative effect on growth. But you know, first of all, economic growth is not the only important economic indicator. It's an important economic indicator. But what we care mo most about, of course, is the welfare of the Chinese people. Government uh, can take measures to continue to, to ensure that incomes of the population increase faster than GDP growth. So GDP growth slows down a bit more. It will still be very high by international standards. China can, can still achieve high growth and deleverage. But in general, we think the Chinese welfare of the Chinese people can continue to increase very, very quickly, even if growth is a bit slower.